optimized. I will say this about investing. Everything you do learn is cumulative. What I learned at 20 is useful. Equity. Welcome to another episode of Equity Mates, a podcast that follows our journey of investing. Whether you're an absolute beginner or approaching Warren Buffett status, our aim is to help break down your barriers from beginning to dividend. My name is Bryce, and as always, I'm joined by my equity buddy, Ren. How are you going? I'm very good, Bryce. I'm very excited for this interview. Uh, We've got a CEO of a company that's close to your heart, Um, and I think also we can officially say our first member of the Order of Australia on the show. <laughs> yes. Yeah, pretty special. Uh, we are privileged to welcome Lindsay Partridge to the show. Lindsay, welcome. Thank you. I'm excited to be here too. So uh, for those of you who haven't come across uh, Lindsay, it's quite uh, quite the resume. He um, was CEO and Managing Director of uh, Brickworks, ASX ticker BKW. Uh, we recently had Tom Milner on the show. Um, you would have remembered through the Brickworks listed investment company. Um, Lindsay Partridge is a ceramic engineer and one of Australia's longest serving public company CEOs. He was appointed CEO of Brickworks in 1999 and Managing Director in 2000 on the occasion of the queen's diamond jubilee in 2012 honors list lindsay was appointed member in the general division of the order of australia for service to the building and construction industry particularly in areas of industry training and career development and to the community and for this episode it is part of our ceo and executive series He is an experienced company director with substantial expertise in all things from government, governance, human resources, compliance, reporting, media, investor relations, mergers and acquisitions, you name it. And we're going to discuss it all. (laughs) (laughs) So, Lindsay, welcome. Thank you. Very impressive resume. Um, We would love to we love to start these interviews by uh, hearing the CEOs talk about their company in their own words. So uh, to kick us off today, um, how would you describe Brickworks? Well, because every, everybody thinks of it about being a brick company and uh, that's not really you know, quite right. You know, 75% of our assets are investments. Um, about half our assets are invested in Washington H. Sol Patterson. About a quarter of our assets are, are invested in our property trust, which is mainly with Goodman. And then the balance is the, the, the building products arm, which is Australia and the United States. That's really only a quarter of the business. So people don't think about that, but there's a lot of, I'm sure we'll get into it, but there's a lot of advantages of having a structure like that particularly when you've got a volatile business, your main business being a volatile business such as building products. Mm. So if you can just unpack those four divisions a bit more for people who aren't Mm. familiar with Brickworks, you said uh, investments, property trust, uh, building products in Australia, building products in North Mm. America. Um, Can you just add a bit of colour to those those Yeah, I might just give you a bit of history as you see how it it worked out. Um, Brickworks uh, was listed on the ASX in 1961, but prior to that was on the New South Wales Exchange. Um, Brickworks was formed by Sydney brickmakers who wanted to buy out the state government from brickmaking and it was formed in, in about 34. And they did that, they, they bought out um, the state government out of brick, work, brick making at uh, Homebush Bay which of course became the site of uh, the Olympics and, and every time the government changed for the next three or four years it got swapped backwards and forwards but in the end we left it with the government to lose money and uh, I think they ran, <laughs> at, ran at a loss until the late 60s but Brickworks existed and then um, the, the, the chairman of Brickworks was a gentleman by the name of William King Dawes, and he owned the Austral Brick Company. The Austral Brick Company was formed in 1908. And so he folded that into Brickworks, and he had two other companies. He folded them all in, and they picked up some other companies. So by 1961, when we listed, we had 11 dry press brickyards around Sydney. So anywhere in Sydney where you see uh, uh, remnants of a Brickworks or uh, 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 remnants of a most probably a uh, um, you know, landfill or something, it was usually one of our plants. Um, the most famous one, of course, down here at St Peter's, yeah, yeah, most people know the brickworks there. That was all ours. Um, so that that's where we got into it. Um, it by they started. Uh, we couldn't keep up after the war, right? And they started building these big factories out at Horsley Park and buying a lot of land. And in 1968, they were worried that London Brick was going to take them over. And they looked on the stock exchange and they saw there was another company there called Washington H. Salt Patterson that was exactly the same size, about 26 or 27 million dollars. And so they swapped um, a million shares each. Uh, the paper the next day said, um, uh, directors on drugs, uh, <laughs> <laughs> shareholders get brickbats. <laughs> Which I've got that on my, on my uh, computer. Screen. But anyhow, um, but, so anyhow, they bought shares in each other up until about 1990 when ASIC said that's enough, it's enough. And at that point, Sol Patterson owned 49.9% of Brickworks. 
um, it's a little bit less today, and we own 43% of them. So that $26 million today, we own, we own 39% today, that $26 million is worth $2.8 billion. Wow. Dollars. So it's been a pretty good investment. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so that's where, that's where sales came from. And what, what we learned was um, that steady income and dividend stream from sales helped us get through the really tough downturns. And remember, you know, we've been through the Depression, World War II, uh, actually World War I. Um, you know, we've been through the Vietnam War. We went through the, the, uh, the Whitlam years. Uh, we've been through the, you know, the Bob Carr shut down housing in New South Wales. We've been, th- you know, we've been through everything. We've been through the GFC and now, of course, we're going through the pandemic. And having that sort of income coming in for investments is one of the things that makes us strong. Um, the, the, the brick business didn't really grow much um, up until really when I took over and there was a new chairman came in. Um, Jim Jim Milner, who was the previous chairman, his nephew Robert Milner, who's the chairman today, um, and uh, we started looking at other assets and we started acquiring um, other companies. And the biggest of those we bought in Australia was Bristol Limited in two thousand and three, and we were Queensland and New South Wales, and they were the rest of the country. And that put us together. And that made us, you know, the biggest brick maker in Australia. We picked up roof tiles. We picked up one masonry plant. We went from there. Well, we picked up other little brick, brick works along the way, and some really great ones out of it, like Barrel Brick is one of ours. And uh, so anyhow, we then bought a whole lot of masonry plants. We ended up with about 10, 11 masonry plants around Australia, so we became the number two masonry uh, business. We got involved in some other things that didn't work, timber, uh, that didn't really work. Um, we were in uh, sewer pipes, we got out of them. We got into floor tiles. It was good for a while, then it went bad, so we got out of that. Um, but we've got a, quite a narrow, very tight sort of business at the moment. We realised that we couldn't grow anymore in Australia and we made the decision about three years ago that we need to expand, we need to expand offshore. And so we bought Glengarry in the northeast of the United States. We've since, since bought two other companies, uh, Sioux City Brick and Redland Brick. Um, and now we um, have, uh, we had about 16 plants, but they're a bit underutilised. We have now about 10 plants uh, in the US and in the northeast. So that's how the building products came together. Um, in the early north, we'd bought all this land in the early 60s um, for surplus clay lands, but as time's gone on, we get a lot more clay comes in from um, excavations and tunnels and things, and so we've actually got more clay today than we most probably started at, particularly here in Sydney. But we had a lot of land; it was really surplus to our needs, and we looked around and we picked a partner, which was Goodman. And it turned out to be a very good choice, um, and they've been wonderful partners ever since. And we realised that there was a future position in industrial space, but there wasn't a future position if you had residential. And we had a lot of the old brickworks at Brookvale and at Eastwood we'd sold off as residential land after we re- uh, fixed them up. But but the industrial, we thought, well, how do you know, and it's one of the hardest things to get your head around, if an industrial development doesn't stack up, it means the raw land is too expensive. And the reason that's the case is because that's the only number that can change. Everything yeah, else is yeah. fixed. Um, and but So, okay, so if you sell it, you always think you're going to sell it too cheap. So by staying and putting in a trust and then staying in it in a 50-50, over the, as you get revaluations um, and the rent goes up, you gradually, if there's any in, in, you know unfairness in the original deal, they get squared up, up, and that's exactly how it, how, how it's worked out for us. Um, so that land um, now, that trust is over two billion dollars. Our share is seven hundred seventy-seven million dollars. Um, it's twenty-five percent of our assets, so it's it's been a really good um, you know, program for us. Mm. Mm. So Lindsay, you're a ceramic engineer by by trade, but um. You're now obviously CEO and MD of, of Brickworks. Mm. Are you able to take us through the, the path from mm. uh, your engineering to C-suite? Well, I think the interesting thing is the fact that I was actually a ceramic engineer, but because no, most people haven't heard about it. <laughs> but, but um, you know, there was uh, my dad was interested in pottery, and there was a old lady a couple of doors down. I was a kid that used to have have a wheel and have classes and things, and after school I'd you know muck around with them, you know, make pots and things, and that was always interesting. I always enjoyed it. Um, and I was looking for something. I knew if I went into something like civil engineering, there'd be a thousand engineers and you wouldn't necessarily stand out. Um, and I had a friend that did it. And at that time, there was a lot of exciting things happening. You know, silicon chips, the space shuttle, you know, they're all using ceramics. There's a lot of exciting things happening. Um, so anyhow, I went into it and I was in a record year of six. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> wow. <laughs> um, and, and as things turned out, you know, um, maybe only one or two of those people was really actually interested in, in going into industry. Um, the others all wanted to be, do research and stuff like that. So, uh, look, times were tough. It was the Whitlam years. It was the 70s. Inflation was high. Unemployment was 12 or 13%. Uh, 
Um, and about halfway through, I said, I can't wait to the end to get a job. Like, I got the you know, backside out of my pants. I need a job. And anyhow, so I, I applied and I got a cadetship with a company which was PGH Industries. And they were, um, they did a lot of things, but they were in, uh, in bricks. Um, and I was doing the summer vacations, so I'd go work for them. And, and so you get accepted by the staff and had a lot of knowledge through that before I even got to the point of graduating. Um, but so when I graduated, they very quickly, um, they had this program that wanted to accelerate people very quickly. They wanted you when you're 30 in head office because they were growing rapidly and they needed people up and it's a bit like what we are. So, um, you know, within six months I was running a factory and I, they worked. One of the things I think for young people when I think about is you don't want to develop yourself straight up a single silo. Like if you're mm. going up the sales and marketing or you're going up the production and then you get to the top of it and then you want to become a general manager and how do you get across the other silo? Mm. Whereas my career was... You know, I already had the technical background. Like I worked in the lab for a month, and then they then they had me doing a marketing job. Then they had me running a piece a, a kiln. Then then they uh, you know sent me into state to run a plant because you know a manager was away. And then they gave me a small business like a unit. Um, and so very quickly, I had a very diverse yep. range. And then I was like sales manager of a big division. And then they sent me to the United States, and I was effectively general manager at the age of twenty five. Wow, jeez. Um, so I, if someone's going to get to the top, you know, they want to be very young thirties in the general manager level because what you need is you need at some point in your career ten years as a GM because it's only when you get to the general manager or the vice president level in the United States that you're really going to have to handle all the issues. You know, and there's nothing to hide behind. You've got to handle the issue, you know. Yeah. Um, and that's when you really get, you know, you really uh, you earn your stripes, if you like that, uh, and lose your hair. <laughs> 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 well, that's right. I'm one <laughs> step ahead of you. <laughs> <laughs> but, but so it's, um, you know, and that's how it went. And then and then um, I, ch- I left that company. I joined Brickworks in 85 and came in. I stepped back. I was an operations manager. I had four factories. I, I, I took over this really bad factory but I thought Brickworks had a better future than the company I was with and that was the main thing you know I didn't mind what the salary was or anything else I didn't care how hard the job was I just wanted to start and they were rebuilding and we pretty quickly rebuilt it in the next four or five years um, and then uh, the previous CEO wanted to retire and I took over in 99 as you said and the rest is history yeah, yeah. Well. Mm-hmm. wow mm-hmm. now you're both the CEO and the managing director of Brickworks just mm-hmm. for people who are unfamiliar with that distinction can you explain the difference between a managing director and a CEO yeah yeah absolutely um, well CEO is chief executive officer you know you're, you're the senior executive often they call call you the executive director might make it clearer you're executive directors in other words you're the you're, you actually work in the job full time but of course if you want to sign any documents well you need a director and so if you actually are a director well, they usually call you managing director some people are both um and i technically could be both but i actually just call myself managing director yeah okay. yeah so i'm the executive director i work there the director point means that i i can sign the documents as a director and the size of brickworks that is all you seem to do is sign your name. <laughs> <laughs> well, these days a lot of us done on the computer, you know, whether it's somebody's expenses or their holiday leave form or something. But, <laughs> but you know, the important documents too, you know, and you've got you know lawyers and that check all the documents before you get to, you've got to sign them. But it's, it can be pile, it can be onerous at times. Yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so Lindsay, from 1999, the share price has grown. When you took over uh, as CEO, the share price has grown from about three dollars to mm. where it's sitting today at about twenty, which is a uh, compound annual growth rate over 21 years of about 10%, mm. which is uh, pretty amazing. What do you think have been some of the biggest drivers of growth and sh- shareholder value from that w- within the business yeah. over that period? Yeah. Well, if you had the dividends, it's actually a bit over 12, it's about 12.6. But <laughs> Sorry. Oh, no, so, so we should have changed <laughs> you. Sure. If, <laughs> if you want to go back to the 68, it's like 13% a year since 1968. Wow. Which That's is like just amazing. Record. You know, yeah. so. Mm. Um, but look, I think one of the things, and look, if you're a young investor and you're looking at, you know, I look at a company I want to buy, I always go back and have a look at the 10-year tables and, and, you know, what's happened to the share price. But if you look at what is the net assets, did the net assets go up every year? Because what a company should be doing is if it's, if it's making $100, it should be giving you know, $50 to their, their shareholders for, as a dividend and investing $50 back in the company. You know, that ratio might vary depending on what sort of company it is and how much capital it needs. But a manufacturing company needs a lot of capital. And it's very hard to grow your assets as a manufacturing company because you're depreciating it out all the time. Mm. And, that, and that sort of runs against you. Whereas... When you look about building assets and you look at like the property, the property is an appreciating asset. So it's something to look at. You know, do you put your money in a car which is depreciating, or do you put put your money in the car yard which is going up in value? You know what I'm saying? Yeah. Um, so uh, 
you've got to increase the value, and which, and of course it also helps if you increase the profit. You know, if if, if the company's been, you know, because there's three or four ways you can value a company. If you're looking at it as the value of the of the income and the, and the profits and the dividend stream, well, then you've got you've got to increase it. But if you're doing that in in a, in, a, in a business where you've got highly depreciating assets, it's very hard to grow it grow it quickly. Um, but that's the first thing. The, the net tangible asset should go up every year, and there'd be very few years in that time that I've been there that hasn't gone up. And the other thing is that in that 20 years, I think I've only had one year or two years where I've, the profit's gone backwards. Um, right. So that's a good thing to get promoted to, you know, make <laughs> make lots of make your boss look good by making lots of money, yeah. um, you know, and that's going to help your career a lot. <laughs> <laughs> so um, we want to we want to touch on capital allocation because mm. you know it's it's one of the more, most important roles as a CEO. Um, do you have a framework for approaching capital allocation decisions? Yeah, we do, and it may be a little bit un- unconventional. Um, and you know, it's it's obviously the obvious thing. Everyone says, "Well, you want to put the put the, the part of your business which is getting the best returns, make sure it's never starved of capital." You know, but but what actually happens in reality is that often you don't get many choices. Like if we've got forty plants out there, and and this one's got a broken, you know, whatever, you know, or well, the kiln's a bit flogged out, um, and I'm, you know, and I've got to replace the kiln. Well, that's it's sort of like you get to the point it has to be done, or the plant stops, and so. By the time you do, you know, health and safety always goes through, environment always goes through. So you do all your health and safety, you do your environment, you've got no choice on that. Then you fix all the things that are about to break down and if you don't fix them, and then what does that leave you with? Not much. <laughs> so, <laughs> so you've got to be a bit creative. And, um, and, you know, and one of the things that we did, we started leasing plants where we knew they were base load. And this was a real, really unusual thing for people like us to do. But, you know, we're, we're building now a $130 million plant. $100 million of that is leased. It's a base load plant. Now, at least you've got to pay the lease whether the plant runs or not. So it's a base load. It's going to go no matter what mm-hmm. under all conditions, right? So you can always pay the lease. And we bury that in the production cost. And what that allows us to do is we bring – if we didn't do that, we couldn't afford the CapEx for a long time in the future. We can bring that forward. We can get the return immediately. We And the saving is such on the modernization and the efficiency in the plant, we can absorb it in the production cost. Mm. And so it works good. And so that's how we find an extra angle which we can get get the finance to really get out, get over those um, those plants. But there's a there's a few other things with capital allocation because it's not only just in plant equipment, so it's like acquisitions and how you fund it. The whole capital management of a large company is quite a complex issue and something that um, – you know, it does keep me thinking from time to time at how best to uh, optimise it. Yeah. Mm-hmm. I mean, the reason that we mm. – I mean, capital allocation is always important, mm. but the reason that we wanted to ask you in particular is because Brickworks has this history of uh, either maintaining or in- increasing its dividend uh, over mm. the course of its mm. life. I think uh, 45 or 46 years since mm. Brickworks last had to decrease uh, in 1976, and that mm. was just a one-off. Um, yeah. So, I mean, having, having that, I guess – obligation or expectation mm. that you're going to at least maintain must add another element to how you think about capital yes. allocation. Yeah, and that's where a little bit unusual, or maybe I didn't fully explain it then, but, um, you know, we're in a volatile business. So, you know, the, the mistake that young brickmakers make um, is that they wait till there's a boom on and then they run down the board and say, I want to build this new plant. Well, the boom only lasts a few years and, and then they commission, we call it, um, you know, a, a make the decision to build in boom and then commission in doom but because you know by the time the plant's ready to, to start the market's gone and then that's, it's like an albatross around people's neck so um what we you, we do is that we invest in the doom we invest in the bottom mm-hmm. to have the plant ready now we don't know we can get caught out like who knew there was going to become a pandemic you know where the government put on an incentive at the moment the market's about to boom and you know we're just bringing this brand new plant out of the ground. Uh, but we've got enough reserve capacity that we, we can we can carry it. So that's counter-cyclical. Yeah. Now, you only can do that if you've got a good asset backing. Mm. And that's what we can do. And so, therefore, that means we've got the plant available. We've got good plant. We've got flexibility. I've always got a spare plant. So if the market picks up quickly, I can get it on. Um, but, okay, to come back to your point on the dividend, uh, so we can pay our dividend out of the dividend we receive from souls plus what we receive from the property trust. That covers the dividends because that's oh, 75% right. yeah. of assets for investment. So we pay 100% of that out basically. Um, and souls has increased for 20 years, so there's a good start. <laughs> and the property trust earnings have gone up every year, you know, for 12 years or 14 years now and are, are going to continue more. So we, I can sit here today and I can absolutely guarantee that, you know, our dividend will most probably be going up the next two years, you know, because I know what's coming through. Yeah, uh, and you know, there's a good chance to be much, much longer. 
So that underwrites it. So the building price can be volatile, and, and I guess we can still cover the cover the dividend. That's that's <coughs> a pretty great business structure that you've created there. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, and there has been other examples on the um, on the market at different times, and then people come along and say, "Oh, you know," and they they, they break it up, and then the, then the original core business goes broke. Mm. Yeah, <laughs> because what happens in the in a really bad bust up? Um, then you, the company can't survive. It just yeah. it hasn't got resources. Yeah. Would there be uproar if you had to decrease the dividend? Oh well, yeah, it'd be a good good time for me to retire. <laughs> 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 so we were looking at your uh, January investor up- update, and the value of the uh, Souls investment and the fifty percent share of the property trust is worth about three point six billion. Correct mm. me if these numbers are wrong. Mm. Um, and Brickworks market cap is about three billion. So mm. in theory, investors are getting the building products business for free. Um, how do you think about this gap between? Net asset value and uh, market cap. Yeah, it gives me a lot to think about. That's for sure. Um, there, there's a few other twists and turns in there. I mean, if we did sell the sole shares, we've got to pay a fair bit of capital mm. gains tax, so that pulls it back. Um, and you know, it's a really a mental exercise. Which one you decide? You know, is 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 there a kilometre dis- discount on the sole shares? Um, or is it that they thinking looking beyond the current boom and building products? They think it's got to slow down a year's time because the stock market looks out eighteen months or so. Mm. Um, you know what? You know is that they think there's going to be inflation and then the interest rates going to go up and therefore the, there'll be cap rate expansion on the industrial and it'll come down in value. You don't know what goes through people's mind, but it's a bit of a mental exercise where you put it. A normal sort of company. Remember that we're the only company on the stock market that has a cross shareholding. Um, it is legal today. You couldn't do it again, but mm. it is legal today. Uh, it was grandfathered. Uh, would buy back its shares, but we can't really do that. Um, so we're sort of limited. We hands help behind our back, but it is a concern, and uh, we're always thinking of uh, creative ways in which we may be able to help uh, close that. And uh, you know, one of the things is we're trying to focus more on the retail shareholders who want the dividend stream. And mm. let's face it, the, a three percent forty franc dividend is, is much better than anything you get in the bank. Yeah. <laughs> and with our history of paying it, you, you know, matter of fact, you put if you put money in the bank, they don't they don't pay you more interest every year. Whereas you put you know invest in, in a brickworks, you get a higher dividend every mm. year. So. Mm. Mm. Yeah, it, it is an interesting choice when you think about do you uh, just let the market figure out that you're undervalued compared to your net assets and let time take its course or do you do you take active steps to really try and close that gap so i mean how, how do you think about that that choice yeah we, we just spent a lot of time thinking about it well i come and see people like equity mates <laughs> 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 because you know we really really want to focus on retail shareholders that can see that you know three percent frank dividend is much better than putting your money in the bank mm. particularly when you've got a long history of, of paying it um but yeah look we haven't got all the all the the tools that a normal company would have we have a cross shareholding it is legal uh, was grandfathered. Um, you couldn't do it again today, but um, it was, so it's very hard for us to buy back um, shares. And you know, I get paid to increase value for my shareholders. So the last thing I want to do is, is actually, you know, um, issue equity. Mm. So that sort of limits in that area. You know, so it makes it quite hard. And um, you know, recently one of the areas where we thought we might have been undervalued that people weren't valuing, you know, salt, the Salt Patterson's holding at the right level. Um, and then most of were doing that because they're thinking that it wasn't real cash and there's all sorts of things that have been floating around about ghost equity and stuff like this. So um, so we sold some. The price was very high and we're worried about a liquidity event on their side of it. They're going into the MISCI index. Um, so we sold some and we, that's when we dropped back to 39.4%. And that was to prove to the market that if we could sell these shares and we would get real cash. And then, of course, but down the track, we had to pay real tax. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> so, yeah. <laughs> so, uh, and that's what sort of limits us. But of course, you can't go buy it back. But I think it, it got them a 60% free float. Uh, um, it got them into the ASX 100, you know, robustly. Um, the share price then recovered. I think we did that at about $28. Um, the share price recovered and now it's like 32 33 So it worked exactly what we, we thought. You know, we've got less shares but actually worth more. Mm. Um, and it proved to the market that, that it, it was real. Yeah. It, was, you know, it wasn't phony. Mm. So, Lindsay, no doubt that last year was a pretty disruptive year for all businesses given the um, mm. COVID. What was the impact of COVID on Brickworks, on, on – uh, you know the many the, di- the different divisions that you've got. Um, did you have to make any drastic changes? Yeah, look, a year ago, I guess we wouldn't be sitting here laughing and joking. It was we would have been locked up mm. somewhere. Yeah, so, yeah. It was it? Look, it really was a different year. It was for everybody, and it was. Um, and I, I'll break that down into 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 three parts. Sure. First of all, like I say, like the industrial sheds just found another gear and took off. Um, you know, and that all of a sudden people realised that wow, you know, this uh, 
click and collect and, and you know online delivery and all this sort of stuff is here for real and you know i don't, I don't know about you guys but i get par- a couple of parcels arrive every day and i'm you know they're coming from all over the world you mm. know so it's it's really now part of a way of our life um, and we'll continue um, and the reason why these big um, ships are getting bigger and while they're getting stuck in the Suez Canal <laughs> <laughs> because, you know, so, you know, and they're making shipping so cheap. So, you know, that, that's here to stay and that's been great and um, and that's really given that business a, a, a shot in the arm and um, that was all well underway. And, and because of it, the government gave us some very rapid um, approvals, you know, Amazon and... Um, a few other things there, new plants we're building ourselves got through. In the in the in Australia, we were lucky that we were considered uh, essential service, so we never got shut down. We were able to deliver product. You know, builders that are building houses, there's a couple of trades on site. They drive to work. They're there on their own. I mean, there was no risk at all of getting COVID, so they're fine. Um, and that was the same all the way through, except this last lockdown in Victoria, where they wouldn't let us deliver for four or five days there. Um, so but we sat down and said, okay, what are we got to do? What's the new world going to be like? What have we got to do to come out of this other side stronger than we are now? What, you know, what have we got to do? And we, we said, okay, well, first of all, we've got to look after our staff and they're going to be working from home. And so we're going to have lots of training. We're going to have lots of meetings. We're going to be communicating. We're going to be making sure that their, their, their wellness is there, that they're, 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 they're good mental state. Uh, and we, we pursued that aggressively. And besides set up all the normal things and we were very well equipped because we had a lot of biomedical kits throughout the company. We'd set up for the Ebola. People thought I was mad at Ebola. They don't think I'm mad now because we just opened the kits, pulled out the thermometer. We had all the haz- hazmat gear, everything. Right. So that all just happened instantly, very early in February. You know, and um, I was getting myself a little bit of trouble from the government because I said they should have closed the borders. Um, <laughs> but so that all went. So we did we had four things: our staff, um, two that we could see that what the sort of products that people wanted was changing. They wanted maybe more homely type products, and there were more models, and we'd be monochromatics. And we didn't have many mono, uh, models in our range. And so we set a very religious, very disciplined product development. And that was also to keep people occupied. Um, and I was stunned at how quickly we produced some of the most amazing products. And that resulted in what we call the B20 launch, which was in October. We launched over 100 new products. It was the biggest thing we ever did. Wow. All done online. Um, and that was, that's was that been an amazing success. And those products are selling strongly today. We realised it was important that we needed to keep our capex up mm. because once again we were at the bottom of the cycle we wanted to invest in the counter cycle we're going to need those plants going forward we want to be competitive uh, and we got very quick we got the approval like in, in six or 12 weeks it was just amazing which did, could take it you know two or three years yeah so that was a brand new brickworks uh, 130 million we, we, it wasn't original it was 100 million we increased 130 million brick capacity 130 million dollars a new masonry works uh, 70 million dollars um, and a lot of other things so that you know that that sort of you know really coming through, and um, the other thing we realised is that the way we were going to relate and communicate to our um, um, customers and our engineers and architects was going to change, and so we started doing what we're doing here, broadcasting, mm. um, and we went from being able to fit fifty people in our design studios to to getting to four hundred, you know, to getting to two or three thousand online. Um, to, and that was just incredible. And they're, they're all over the world. They come from ten and mm. fifteen, twenty countries. You know? So that worked well. So we've since actually built um, uh, two broadcast booths. I outside my office have a proper broadcast booth, a little one, and then we have a big one that seats four people uh, at a design studio in, here in Sydney. And we're building another one in New York, in a New York design studio where the same thing. And so we'll be able to run events from New York and then and stream it here into Sydney and. And that's just the way of the future. Yeah, you know, that's so. cool. Every business is yeah. now <laughs> investing in that, that kind of broadcasting yeah. capacity. Yeah. I mean, it takes a bit to set up. But when it costs us, you know, the best part of a million dollars. And uh, But, you know, you've you, you got that many lights on. You've got to have massive air conditioning and, this, mm. you know, mm. anyhow. Um, but in America, it was a really quite different story. Uh, you know, we were impacted by COVID. You know, there's no way you're going to get Americans to sit at home. Um, <laughs> and, I mean, they tried different things, but, I mean, and some of the areas of the Midwest, we had like one of in Iowa, we had a meatworks down the road, 2,000 employees, and went through there like smoke and, you know, everyone's away. So the, the statistics are horrifying. Um, we had single days with 10% of our workforce away, so we couldn't keep the plants up. We've had over 10% of our staff. We've got about 800 staff there, so you know, really about 100 have had it. But the most horrifying statistic is that we lost, we didn't lose any staff members, but we lost 20 of their family members. Oh, right. Which was very tragic and um, you know very difficult on my staff over there that was you know trying to look after those people. Mm. Um, but look, you know, having said that, they're out of it now, and this is something that people we don't realise. I mean, we're out of winter, but we're out of COVID. We, we're lucky to have single digits away today, 
and my view is by you know the end of April, you know, COVID will be a thing of the past in the United States. I mean, they're currently vaccinating the population of Australia every week. Yeah, you know, yeah. so they're they're counting out of this at a million miles an hour, and as you know, we're we're not so so quick on these things. So <laughs> we're struggling a bit. <laughs> So um, we'd love to understand what you think the outlook for uh, Brickworks is, and I guess in particular the uh, buildings products business. Um, I, I imagine a lot of people listening, and I, I don't want to speak for Bryce, but uh, definitely me, uh, it's, not a, it's not a business that I th- have thought a lot about. Um, so what are some of the key drivers of the industry and of the Brickworks business uh, that investors should be aware of? Well, our biggest business is, is bricks or... And the second business is masonry and roof tiles, and they go majority into housing. Yes, we do a lot of you know basements and things in in commercial buildings, and we're doing a lot of the railway metro stations at the moment in, in concrete blocks. But but the ex- interesting stuff is, um, is 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 the bricks, and so the drivers, of course, is, is the amount of detached houses. And of course, what's come out of COVID, we're seeing this big shift back to houses from apartments, which we think is fabulous. <laughs> and you know, people moving from from you know not only from ha- from apartments to houses, but also from the city to the regional areas. Mm. Um, and this is worldwide. This is not just here. This is happening worldwide. So that that I think is a trend that even if it comes back a little bit when COVID's over, I don't think it'll revert immediately. People, people, a lot of people had a real deep think while they've been sitting at home for six or twelve months and said, "Well, I don't really like my life, and I, this is what I'd really like." And a lot of companies are saying, "Well." We only want you here two or three days a week. So, uh, and some companies even saying you you've got to stay home Monday and Friday. So, yeah. so well, I don't need to live in Sydney. I can work anywhere. I'll I'll, I'll work in the country somewhere and then just commute. Mm. What they haven't worked out, of course, is that if somebody's job can be done from somewhere in the country, what can also be done from from the Philippines yeah, or India. Yeah, so, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I'd be a bit careful. I said, oh, I, I came to the office every day, but. Um, <laughs> <laughs> So this uh, this recent run up in house prices, especially in regional areas, is uh, is a great forward looking indicator for you guys. Oh, I think so. And what it does, it makes um, medium density development stack up. That something a project was a bit marginal is now not marginal. It's it's very doable, and I think so that always gives it a bit longer legs. Uh, the the only negative in the horizon, of course, is the lack of immigration. Mm. Um, although we were at cyclical low, you could see that the uh, vacancy rate was very low. The rental vacancy rate was low. Um, and even though you would have thought a lot of students went home and a lot of uh, backpackers and things, but, um, you know, the, the vacancy rate's low across the country. So, you know, usually that's an indicator that people need houses. Yeah. And particularly if they can get the ownership level up, you know, I don't, I, don't hold me to this, but say the ownership level 60%, um, you know, if you can get it to 61 or 62, now that's a good thing for our country. Um, but there's a lot of people in 1% of the population going from a renter to a owner. That's, that's a... Yeah, that's true. a good thing, and mm. young people. This time, because it never was so good for them. They, you know, they could get twenty five thousand from the government. Some states gave twenty five thousand. A lot of couples took twenty five thousand each out of their super. You know, yeah. they got a hundred thousand. I mean, when could you ever get a hundred thousand dollars deposit? You know? Yeah. Um, so that was obviously driving it. Investors are coming back, and upgraders are, are there. So. Mm. So Brickworks is a uh, leading brick maker here in Australia mm. and over in the US. Are there any plans to expand into other markets, Europe, Asia? Oh, at, the, at the moment, I just really want to get a really good um, base, you know, beachhead in the US and get that up to where, where we think it can go. Um, I think over time there's going to be more acquisition opportunities there. Um, to give you some idea, pre to the GFC, America was making about 10 billion bricks per annum. And they're building about 2 million houses. Um, after the GFC, it really got knocked around and it's only got back to about you know, the moment, one and a half million houses and about... Four billion brick. So, I would think there's a fair bit of um, return. A lot, of, a lot of surplus capacity, which we've been doing our best to soak up and mm. sort out, particularly in our area. But uh, I think if there's a good solid boom over there, you know, the next three to five years, and everyone's talking about, you know, low interest rates for long term, I'd, I'd be a bit worried about inflation coming back. But, but yeah, they want really solid full employment and, and good inflation before they mm. they take their foot off the gas. So. For comparison, how many bricks are we doing in Australia? Uh, Australia's about one and a half billion. Yeah. It, oh wow! Yeah, yeah. yeah. yeah our bricks are bigger though. Um, Australian bricks are about a third bigger than an American brick. Really? So right. our, our one and a half billion is more like you know, two and a bit. You know, bigger right. US ones. Yeah. There you go. Yeah, we give them a hard time about why it. Why so it you, you call that a brick? Look at this. <laughs> 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 well, I, I just sort of assumed that bricks would have been standard around the world. Well, yeah. well, you consider they sort of came from England, you'd think so, wouldn't they? But um, no, we make a, we mainly make one or two sizes in Australia, but in um, the US, it would be pretty normal. We could make a ten or a dozen in every plant. 
Right. Okay. Yeah. Wow. There you go. Reduce the size, charge the same price, and yeah. away you go. <laughs> <laughs> That's what they do in retail. Yeah. <laughs> no, the bricks are the best thing you can buy. We guarantee them 100 years. I mean, you know, what, what, what could you buy better, better value than a brick? <laughs> <laughs> so, Lindsay, we, we do love uh, to ask some questions around, I guess, like people and culture and, mm. and leadership. A lot of the uh, fund managers we speak to talk about um, the importance of that, mm. uh, of, of who the leader is and the culture that they're trying to build. Um, so we'd love to get some of your thoughts on it. I guess starting here, um, as a CEO, do you have a leadership philosophy? Well, I do, but it's sort of like it's evolved over a lifetime. Like leadership's not not something you're born with. I think leadership's something that you you learn as you go along, and you make a few mistakes, and you try and improve it. And um, and also, what's required of you is changing. I mean, you've only got to look at the discussions around. You know, in the US, the big thing is a, is a racial discussion, and and here we've got the hot discussion about you know women not being treated properly. Um, you know, and some of these things, I mean, it stuns me a bit because I thought you know most companies got over this you know ten or fifteen years ago. But there's some basics. If you don't if you don't do some basic things like looking after your staff, no one's going to look up to you as a leader. They're going to look down to you. So it's really really important that you know you're honest, um, you do what you say, you treat people with dignity. Um, you look out for pe- people. It might be outside the company rules, but if someone's got a problem, you step in and give them all the aid and assistance you can. Um, if you don't do those basic sorts of things, you won't get any respect at all. And I think that's where leaders sometimes go wrong, and they, they can't understand it. You know that that, that happens, um, and and that goes back to if you've got an employee, you know we have like a no no asshole rule, and <laughs> and, and if you've got a, you know if you've got somebody who's a bit of a bastard to work with, then it disrupts everybody around them. And they can't do their job, and all they, and they've got this you know, conflict, and so you've got to go find them and get rid of them. Mm. Um, you know, and that's important. You do that. I, I think I've got a pretty good team at the moment, and they're all happy, you know, because there's no one. You know, they come to work, do their job, and you know, they go home, and they, and you know, so those sorts of things are important. But there's a whole lot of basic things you need to have a, um, you know, a, a sort of plan around. You know, how you're going to you know, train and develop people. You're going to give them promotions. I mean, people become very. Uh, loving towards the, uh, the company if they get promotion, you know, and if they end up at a level they never thought they would achieve, and they could, that doesn't have to be in the high levels. I, we had a, a guy who was a greaser, and we wanted fitters. So instead of going outside, we said to him, "Do you want to do an adult apprenticeship?" And I worked his wages. So his wages never went down; they only went up. And four years later, five years later, he said to me, "I never ever thought I'd be a tradesman." You know, and some of these guys then went on and did a second trade. You mm. know, they're double certified. So we got some wonderfully um, skilled employees that have come up you know but they'll, they'll work with us forever yeah, mm. yeah never thought i mean they earn, earn huge money but uh, mm. but now but they but yeah so that they they work forever and that's what we want we want yeah. people to stay with us so we'll go out of our way to make sure that we look after our staff to mm. keep them you know yeah, yeah. for those in our uh, community who are aspiring uh c-suite or gms um when you're hiring leaders within your business are there any sort of key characteristics that you you know don't compromise on well, if we're hiring for the most senior levels, um, we do a pretty pretty tough um, analysis. And one of the analysis we do, which you might not often hear about, is uh, we do sort of a graph. Um, and on one side, it's like on the vertical, it's like maturity of decisions. And then on the other axis, it's um, your agility. Now, and then we graph everybody. I don't like anything. You know, you've got a, a bunch, most of your staff are in the middle. You've got a, a few on the left that aren't so agile <laughs> and a few on the right um, that, that – you know, very agile, make very good decisions, and they're your, your top leaders. Mm. And now you might say, why? And the answer is this, is that the problems that the chief executive gets are problems that no one else in the business could solve uh, and usually haven't seen before, and you've got to come up with a creative decision to get out of it. And if you don't solve it, you've got a problem. Mm. Right? So um, creative, and you need to make, as I said, you know, responsible decisions. You can't, you know, make, make flippant decisions. You might make them quick, but you, they've got to be considered um so that, that's that's what we look and uh and that's that's worked out worked out pretty well for us yeah nice mm. it's interesting yeah. mm. so um people often love talking about the best times as a leader or as an investor we want to maybe ask you about one not so good time uh was there is there a particular mistake uh as a leader that stands out for you uh, in your time at brickworks and what were some of the lessons that you learned from it yeah, or because when you sort of said that, but look, I tell you, the worst day for any chief executive is when one of your staff or a member of the public gets killed. You know, 
And you know that they, they, you know, sorry to put a bit of a bummer on it, yeah. but but you'll never forget those days. You know, no one gets paid enough to have to tell a family that they've, you've just killed their son or daughter or something. You know, like that's just they're just yeah. they're just terrible, terrible days. Um, and you know, yes, there's a lot of soul searching goes on. Could we, what could we have done different to avoid it and that? And, but but sometimes it's just out of control, or your staff member was just an innocent bystander. You know, and things happen. But um, but look, as far as making uh, mistakes. You know, yeah, look, good question. I could I could think of a few things, but look, you don't always get things right. right. Um, you sometimes make mistakes on people, and you, you wish you hadn't have because oh, we went too long. You know, um, one of the things that I always look out for is that people not being a self starter on people problems. You know, right people on the bus, wrong people off the bus, mm. and you know, it's very easy for to wait too long. You know, I like to give people a decent chance to prove themselves, but but inevitably when you let them go, that everyone else comes along and said, oh yeah, I thank God for that and. We just can't work out. You didn't know he was doing this and doing that and something like that. So getting your people right is very important and and you'll always feel feel disappointed in yourself if you wait too long. Yeah. Um, We've done a lot of acquisitions and, of course, you're not always going to get them right. Um, I thought that the the timber industry would be a good one for us because we were uh, uh, using and um, preparing hardwoods and it was a fashion item. We could get high prices for it. But it was just, you know, supply line, it was always back to the government. And, you know, you could never invest because you could never get a log licence long enough to to warrant the investment. So you ended up with all these worn-out old mills, which were dangerous and people were getting hurt. And, mm. you know, and then the other thing with the timber industry is that, um, you know, you, you saw a log and you're lucky to get sort of 30 35% out of it the first time, a lot of waste. And then... Um, then you dry it and it shrinks 15%. Yeah, you know? right. <laughs> so you think about it, you only got 20 or 25% of what you started with, you try to make a profit out of it. So it's very hard. Um, and no, and I, yeah, maybe we should have got out of there a bit quicker. Um, other things, you know, like the tile business was a great business. I loved it and I had a lot of experience in it. Um, but, you know, it, was, it worked well when the Aussie was 75 cents. But, you know, at 85 or 90 cents, you know, it was in trouble and we, we just thought we can't, we started to lose money. And then, we decided to get out, but lucky we did because the dollar went to a dollar ten. Yeah, yeah. If you remember, <laughs> yeah. a dollar ten would have smashed us. And yeah, so, yeah, yeah. you know, sometimes it's not your fault. It's just the, the world changes and it, it no longer works. So mm. you just got to move on. Yeah. Mm. And then on the flip side, Lindsay, are there is there a moment that you look back on and uh, you're particularly proud of from a leadership point of view? Yeah. yeah look, I think um, I think you know putting the property trust together was was was. Um, Stroke of genius, and I guess maybe, maybe the Bristol was, but but you know, it wasn't easy. Like, people think, oh, I think sometimes think when you know, all of a sudden we get this approval to build a new plant or something that it was easy, they don't realize that that you know, we've had to do a, a lot of work to convince the board. I mean, it's easier these days, um, they're very, very supportive, but um, you know, the Bristol acquisition, I went to the board four times to get it. Um, we ended up paying a bit more than we otherwise would have, but we did get it through, and it was vital to the company in the future years because Western Australia boomed and. New South Wales was mm. a disaster, and without Western Australia, we would have been a mess. And so it, it was it really worked out to be a great decision. But, but the property has absolutely exceeded everybody's um, um, any any idea that we ever thought we would mm. do as well or be as big. And it just was nowhere there. I mean, clearly we're going to very close and very soon we'll clear a billion dollars in assets in there, wow. um, and it's growing topsy turvy. And um, you know, yes, I did have to argue with the board a few years to get them to realise that we need to hang on to this land and not not just sell it. Because you sell it, you pay a special dividend, and then what? You've got yeah, nothing, nothing to show yeah, for it. Yeah. You, 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 you take it a bit slower and you invest it, and then down the track. And it's it's grown at 18% a year. Uh, gets a, it's it's better return than souls even. You know, it's 12 or 13% mm. um, return annually. Um, you know, so it's it's a brilliant business. And anything, you know, we need, we need to be pouring more mon- more money into it. Mm. Yeah, so, mm. it's got a it's got a fair few blue chip clients as well, doesn't it? Like Coles uh, mm. has a warehouse there. Amazon. Amazon. Yeah, we're yeah. building Amazon at the moment. Uh, well, you know, yes, a twenty-year lease with a one point seven trillion dollar company. Not to many <laughs> yeah. of those around. <laughs> the one thing I can tell you is, when that building's finished, it will be the lowest cap rate in Australia. Um, and it will, you know it has to be. Um, I was out there yesterday, actually having a look at it. And it's just a, a massive building. I don't know how to explain to people. It's got twice the steel as the Eiffel Tower. It's it's <laughs> wow. bigger than you know. It's it's like it's hundred ninety thousand square meters. So it's like forty something football fields. Wow. Right? wow! They had five teams laying concrete. Each team was starting about four thirty in the morning. Each team laid a football field of concrete every day. They were there for five months. What? <laughs> what? Right, it's got five months. Five teams, right? So, and then, then they had, then the car parks, two thousand car spots. 
Jeez. You know, at the moment, they've got to have – they're working around the clock. As Amazon, is, if, if you said you can deliver, you know, in three months' time, they want it in two. And if you, if you it's, I'll get it back to two. Now they want it in six weeks. Like, mm. It's just a relentless pressure. Wow. Where's wow. the facility? It's uh, We call it Oakdale West, but it's, you'd call it um, Eastern Creek, I guess. Yeah, right. Yeah. Um, okay. The Oakdale <laughs> Estate is a very big estate. That is scale. Um, it is. It's, it's enormous. And, yeah. um, you know, it's ten stories high and uh, uh, it goes over the cur- curvature of the earth. <laughs> I say that, but you get anywhere near it, you'll see it because it just stands out. Yeah. Wow. Yeah, yeah, what's yeah. that building over there? You know. Yeah. So, yeah. And then Cheers. the coals going in next to it is actually a bigger building. Um, different systems. The Amazon uses the um, uh, stillage on on a, on a flat robot, which runs around a million miles an hour, and then brings it the, the product to the, the the packer who takes it out and puts it in a tote that gets wrapped up. Whereas in the coals, you've got um, like a, a rack system where you've got a robot that runs up and down the racks and yeah. pulls out a couple of boxes of this or a couple of boxes of that to yeah. send out to the, to the store. So Yeah. It's a fascinating, fascinating. world, all that mm-hmm. supply chain mm-hmm. stuff. Mm-hmm. Um, so, Lindsay, we'd like to uh, finish with the same final question. Um, but before we do, we just want to say a massive thank you for – taking the time to speak to us today it's been a Mm -hmm. great interview i think we've both got a lot out of it i'm sure our audience will as well Mm -hmm. um but we will finish with this final question (laughs) um if you think about brickworks in 10 or 20 years uh what does success look like for you oh look success would be um you know we continue growing at the rate we are and you know it won't be me obviously somebody else but they'll have to be you know make some hard decisions about how, how they're going to grow the company um, you know, I'd expect that we might be, you know, across three or four continents as far as the manufacturing side's concerned. Um, that the the property trust will be right down the east coast of Australia because uh, we have other land in Victoria as well. Um, and we might have acquired more land to, to develop. Um, I, you know, it, I think Brickworks has, um, you know, might have been paying the dividend for 25 years and be considered a, a, a dividend aristocrat, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> which that would be good because uh, I intend to hold a few shares myself in retirement. <laughs> You're not going to be at the helm in 20 years? No. no. <laughs> <laughs> Lindsay, um, very much appreciate you taking the time to come on the show today. As Alex said, our audience would have uh, got a lot out of that. We would certainly enjoy speaking to uh, CEOs and MDs to get a bit of an insight into the companies that are listed on the stock exchange and, and our investors, I mean, our community c- can go and invest in themselves. So thank you very much. Yeah, my pleasure. Thank you. I will say this about investing. Everything you do learn is cumulative. What I learned at 20 is useful.